find a minute to get there. Before we start, uh, Liz and I, we, we really want to uh, take a moment and just express our, our gratefulness and our gratitude to all of those men and women that get up tomorrow morning and go to work so that folks like us can go because you come back on Sundays and you give. And uh, we're just grateful for the effort that you make every day working out there in the, in, the, uh, in the world and rubbing shoulders with people that aren't saved and putting up with a lot of nonsense that I don't have to put up with. I go to work in the morning and go to an office where everybody loves the Lord. Amen? So we just want to let you know how much we appreciate it. And, uh, and we're, we're grateful that the Lord uses you. And we thank, thank the Lord every day for those that are sacrificing so that we can serve. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, um, verses 1 through 5 will be our reading here this morning. Uh, I want to speak to you a little bit about prayer. You know, a missionary comes uh, to your church and he pulls one of these out of his pocket and he says, pray for me. And uh, once in a while, an evangelist might come, and he'll have one, but I've never met a pastor that handed me one of these. I've never met a singing group that handed me one of these. It's always missionaries, and it's important that we understand how to pray for them, and, and we read the letters, and there's, there's items of interest that, that they're asking for prayer about. It could be special needs. It could be things, but there's a... Uh, some, some great insight into this passage as Paul uh, is, is asking for prayer on his behalf as he ministers. And so I just want to share a few of these things with you. And I do want to remind you that our prayer card's in the back. And it's a new one. It's just Liz and I now. And, uh, you know, we had to throw Richard out. And then after a few years, we got Jenny out. And now we're free. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, there, you know, uh, anyway, it's great. And Jenny made this. She took that picture and she designed it. She actually designed that font. So she didn't just find it. She actually made that font. And uh, that's what she's in college doing, and we're really happy for her. And Anyway, make sure you get one or two of them, however many you need. They're on that back table. And notice what it says here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable men, and wicked, uh, unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you, and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that you both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God, and into the patient waiting for Christ. Let's pray. Father, this morning, uh, we are here, and we've gathered. We've made it our business to come out this morning. And so I pray that our trip would not be in vain. I pray that your word would have free course, that it would fall on good soil, and that it would bring forth that which you have purposed for it in the lives of every individual here. There's someone here that's not saved, that it would effectually work in them that they might understand that Christ is their only hope. For those that have trusted in you, Lord, that they would find comfort, consolation in your promises. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would do the work that only you can do here this morning. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the text, the Apostle Paul, he gives us two very specific prayer requests that we can pray on behalf of missionaries or other Christian workers or uh, any, in, in that sense, for all of the Lord's people. And to sum it up, this is, I think, what he's saying in this passage. He says, pray for the word of the Lord to spread, and that the Lord's people, as they rely upon his faithfulness, they will stand firm in the spiritual battle. I think that's the gist of what he's trying to say. Uh, he asked for specific prayer. Now, these converts in Thessalonica, they were experiencing great, persecution. Um, things were difficult for them. And he's writing from the church in Corinth. That's where he's at at the time he sends this letter 
to this group of believers here in Thessalonica. And we'll mention that in a minute. But the, the primary petition that he has is, number one, that the Word of God would have free course. That the Word of God would have free course. And I think about that phrase, free course, and, and, and what it brings to mind is that it would be unhindered. That the Word of God would be unhindered. That the Word of God would have liberty of movement. Uh, that would be without obstacle. Uh, another sense or understanding of the word having free course is, is as, as it has the liberty to flow and do that which God has purposed behind it, but also that it would be received. That's another idea behind that, that phrase free course. Um, God has chosen preaching as that main vehicle that will move the words of God from his mouth into the hearts of men. So God has decided that preaching is the main, I didn't say it's the only. Uh, you know, God can use a drama. God can use a song. God can use a play. Uh, God can use the choir. But God himself has said, my, my vehicle of choice is preaching. Uh, that's what I've designed uh, so that the word of God, as it flows out of my, my mouth, it will get into the hearts of men and do that which I have purposed it for do. That's the means of transference, if you will. So God says his word has purpose. God says that his word has a targeted audience. God says that his word has a desired effect. If you go with me to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 55, I want to show you something. There's a, a familiar verse for many, Isaiah chapter 55, and I want to look at verse 10. And some of you will recognize this passage. Isaiah 55 and verse 10 is what we'll read. It says, For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, that's probably more familiar for you here in Somerville, the snow as it comes down from heaven. But notice it says, It returneth not hither. Snow does not fall from the sky and then somehow float back up into the atmosphere. It stays here. Isn't that right? And sometimes it gets pretty thick on the ground, but he says it waters the earth. Because as it melts here in these mountains and finds its way into the creeks and then into the small rivers, eventually it gets back out to the ocean. And God says that's where it started. Notice in Isaiah 55, he says, But it watereth the earth and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and, and what? Bread to the eater. So God says, I have this system. I've designed it. And what happens is, is uh, the clouds form over the ocean and, and they receive the moisture from the ocean. And as the wind brings those clouds over the mountains, uh, it either drops that moisture in the form of rain or, or in a cold spell, it drops it in the form of snow. And irregardless of whatever form it falls in, it, eventually it melts. And it finds its way back through the rivers and through the creeks and the, and the ways that water moves back out into the ocean, and that cycle repeats itself over and over and over. And it's self-perpetuating, you understand? It doesn't need man to do anything. God designed it, and it just works. And he says, the purpose that I had behind that is so that when the, the, the seed that I formed and placed into the ground, when it receives that water, it, it brings forth life. The life that I contained in that seed, and it comes up in the form of corn or, or in wheat or in barley or sugar beets or whatever it is. And then you know what? We benefit from that in God's goodness. And we get to eat. <laughs> and as Baptists, we say, amen. We get to eat. All right? And this is what he says. Now, you think about that system, and they taught, about us, they taught that to us in, in elementary school. You remember that? And I don't remember the word they used for it, but it's some sort of evaporation process that just continues itself, and this is how it works. Now, notice in verse 11 in our text, notice those first two words. He says, so shall. Now, that's just another way of saying in like manner. So shall my word. Now, just like I have designed a system that is self-perpetuating and, and needs no maintenance involved in order to benefit and to, to, to fulfill my purposes to provide food, he says, so shall my word that goeth forth out of my mouth. He says, you know what? Just like I have an, 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 an ecosystem, I have a gospel system in place as well. And as the word goes out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, he says. 
And it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. God says, my desire is to feed mankind, and I've designed a system that will, that will be a part of that. But God says, I have also a great desire to see man saved. I desire to see men follow me. I desire to have a relationship with man. And, and, it, and it's based upon their receptivity of the word of God. And, and as the word goes out of my mouth, and, and it finds its way into the heart of a man, what it does is if the, if the soil is prepared and the man receives that word, then, then, then it, it brings forth everlasting life in the heart of that person. And, and you know what happens as we were singing? We freely received it, we freely give. The idea, God says, is that as I sow the seed in the hearts of men and it brings forth fruit, then others will be influenced by that. Others will receive the benefits of that. And as one is saved, it leads to another. You think about the gospel. And you know, the gospel has never been anywhere except where a man brought it. Would you agree with that? Gospel did not mystically just float over the air and just land somewhere. Men brought it after it was planted in their hearts. They brought it to different places. And that's how the gospel is spread. And that's how the gospel has free course. And Paul says, pray. That, that this, this plan that God has in place and this purpose that he has behind the message, that it, would, that it would be met without hindrance, that there would be no obstacles in its way. I remember back in Bible school, I don't, I don't know what, what you remember, Pastor, but they, they had a class called homiletics. Remember that? And homiletics is, is basically a, a guy who preaches pretty well is trying to show the students some ways of how to preach well. And there's some that are good at it and some are not. They gave us books on how to, and it's not interpretation. That's a different class that you had on a different day. But homiletics was the preaching class. And they would teach us some things about how to make an outline, how to deliver things and, 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 and things like that. But I remember this. I remember that preaching, one of the, there were three main purposes that as a preacher of God's word that we were instructed to be mindful about. As you preach, they told me, you need to understand that one of the purposes that you are trying to fulfill is, number one, increased knowledge. You're trying to share information with people and give them the sense of the text and deal with the facts of, the, of what the Bible says. That's your, your first and foremost purpose as you stand in a pulpit. You need not go there, but in Nehemiah, uh, in chapter 8 and verse 8, it says, So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly, and gave the sense, it says, and caused them to understand the reading. And, and so God desires that those that proclaim his word would at the very least share information with people. You know, the sinner needs to understand something before he can feel anything. He needs to understand his condition before God. He needs to understand that he's lost and undone and under his wrath if he does not repent and receive what God has offered, the solution. You understand, it's much like a, a, a doctor's visit. You don't go until you understand you're sick. You need to have that information. And you need to have that understanding of my condition before I'll be, I'll be incited into any form of action. So the first thing that we try to do as we preach the Word of God is, is deliver the argument. Is to deliver the, uh, the persuasion. And that's what Paul did. Paul said, I persuaded men. In other words, he, he presented them with a list of facts and a, and a, and a body of, of information that says, this is, this is how it is. And this is what it says. And we read this Bible verse, and, and we're looking at it, and, and I'm trying to give you the understanding of it. And what I did was I went over to Isaiah 55 and, and tried to bring it to bear on 2 Thessalonians 3 so that somewhere in there you went, oh, I get it now. I understand what free course is. Does that make sense? Do your heads like this or like, okay, something, right? Give me, give me, a, give me some sort of hint or whisper that we're, we're on the same page here. This morning in the adult Sunday school class where I went, we talked about a phrase. And we looked at it not in one or two or three, but by the time I was done, I think I convinced everyone there that we need to be a part of bringing them forward. I think we convinced you that with the Bible, 
I shared the information with you. The second thing as I preach, I'm, I'm conscious of this, and, and sometimes it, I'm more conscious than others, but I desire to move the emotion. Not only do I want to share information with you, but I want to move the emotions. I desire to help the listener gain a different perspective on a matter. Uh, hopefully the biblical perspective on a matter. God's perspective on an issue. Instead of what the news says or, or the conservative blogs, I want you to understand what God has to say about this thing. Amen? I want you to follow God before you follow Rush Limbaugh. Amen? Amen? That's all I'm saying. Now, I'm not against those guys, but, but you know what God says is far more important than what those men say. Amen? And so you think about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ used parables to that end. Jesus Christ would, would talk about the, uh, the lost son, and he talked about the lost sheep, and he talked about a prodigal son. And, and each parable, when you think about it, it evoked a, an emotion from the heart. That's what it did. Uh, the listener made an, an emotional investment in that. And the listener sensed the importance of repentance. Uh, they yearned for the reconciliation of the son and the father. They felt the joy of forgiveness when the father called for that fatted calf. You understand? They were emotionally invested in, in the story that he was telling. And the heart must be moved if we're ever to hope to provoke and see real change in the lives of the listeners. The heart must be moved. Then finally, I desire to see the will to be incited into action. Ultimately, the Word of God should promote a decision based upon the instruction that you've received. Does that make sense? Ultimately. I'll say this. It is the application of knowledge, not the mere understanding of it, that results in changed lives. You, you can't just be a hearer of the Word. You must be a what? You're not going to do the Word of God unless you've, you've made a decision based on something that evoked an emotion out of you, which was based on some facts that you heard. And they challenged you. And you felt that you needed to do something uh, uh, about it. And then you came to an altar and, and you made a decision. Years ago at a missions conference, that's what happened in my life, sitting in the, in the pew just like you. The man got up and talked about souls dying and going to hell. And he said, it's just like souls going, just like water over a waterfall. He said, does anybody care? Oh, man. I said, I care. I care. And he said, well, what are you, who's going to go? Who's going to go? And, and we came forward and we came down to the altar and I talked to the pastor. And, and, and one thing led to another. And next thing you know, we're in Mexico. You understand? I heard the facts that there was a great need, and my heart was moved. But it would have been nothing if I just continued to sit in the pew and do nothing about it. God moved me and incited me into action, and, and we spent many fruitful years on the mission field. Look with me in Luke chapter 18. If the application of knowledge is not the mere understanding of it that results in changed lives. Luke chapter 18 and verse 1. We doing okay? We still doing okay? You guys are a quiet bunch. I'm used to a little more rowdier crowd. All right. That's all right. Luke chapter 18 and verse 1. Notice what, what it says in the text. It says, and he spake a parable unto them. Now notice these next three words. It says, to this end. And that's what we're talking about. You understand? This is the reason why he spoke this parable. And the reason is that men ought always to pray. And faint not. So, and then he talks about that judge, the unjust judge, and, and you go on and you read through that parable. But Jesus started out telling you, this is why I'm telling you this story. I want to I wanna get you emotionally invested in this thing and the petition that this woman made incessantly until this judge finally yielded to her and gave her her desire. And he says, you understand, it's just like that with God. Do not cease to pray. Continue to pray. And continue to pray. It was to this end that he gave the parable. So Paul, back in 2 Thessalonians 3, if you turn back there, Paul is basically praying that as he and others preached, the word of God would be free from the things that might hinder the productivity of the word. Paul is seeking for an opportunity for the word of God. In Colossians 4, he said, With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds. 
He said to the Corinthians, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Now, here's, here's my thought behind uh, praying about the word of the Lord to have free course. I think eventually if the Lord tarries, we will find ourselves back in Mexico. I have faith to believe that. I, I believe that the Lord is as clear as he's ever told me to do anything. It's just as clear now as it's ever been before to go back to Mexico. And I will no doubt find myself there. But I want to I wanna suggest something to you and think, help, help you think through this. You know, just because the Mueller family is going to go to Mexico doesn't mean that there will be results. There's no guarantee because it's not contingent upon us. You understand? It's contingent upon God opening the hearts of people. It's not my ability to preach. It's not my ability to explain. It's not my, my zeal and soul winning. None of those things. What it is is that God has to open up that door. God has to, to do the work in the heart of a man in order, in order that he be born again. I cannot do it. And so you say, okay, I'm going to pray for these missionaries. And, and there, there are some missionaries that find themselves, uh, Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is so rural. I went there last year by God's grace. And, and, and I saw what a challenge it is to minister there. You can, you can have to walk for days and days and days to get to some of these villages. There's no roads there. There's just little footpaths. And there's thousands of them like that. And the country's so small, but it's, it's so difficult to reach because you don't have the ability to get to where the people are. I recall years ago we were, uh, where you folks came and visited us in Chetumal, we had a guy uh, out of us that went over to Belize. And it's just the little country right next door. And I, I got it in my heart to go over there and help him, and we were going to form and, and organize an evangelistic campaign where he was because he had gone to a, an area that was predominantly Hispanic, in Belize, and they, and they they mostly spoke Spanish there. So he went there, and because it's an English speaking country, you understand. So he went there, and I remember we gathered up the guys and the gals. We had about 25 people. Remember that, Liz? And we got it. You, you remember that big bus we had? That bus. We stuck them all in there, and I got day passes for everybody. I got permission to go there for one day from the Belizean government. I even got permission to bring a cooler full of hot dogs over, and they don't allow pork in their country. They don't allow it to cross the border. You have to buy it there. And things are really expensive in Belize. In those days, a gallon of gas was like seven bucks a gallon. Belize in dollars, you know. So we got it all together. We organized it all. We went over there to Belize. Now, listen, on two separate occasions, Liz and I had, had helped start works with the idea that we received from a pastor up here in Oregon, this mass canvassing, Brother Mutchler. Remember that book he had? And so we, we implemented some of those principles. We would go out and just hand out tens of thousands of flyers and invite people. And we'd seen it work. And we'd seen it work. And we'd seen that work. And so we went to Belize with that same kind of idea. We're going to go out there. And I remember the houses were far apart like here. You know, I mean, you don't just go door to door in a little apartment pump. So there's nothing like that. It's walking a half mile down the road and going to the next door. So we all gathered up, and, and, the, and the missionary pastor there, Frankie Canche, he, he divided us up and gave us little maps and sent us out, and out we went. And I remember going up to one house, and, and you know, they, they wouldn't even come to the door. I mean, they were sitting right inside the door, watching TV, and they just completely, they looked at me and said, Preacher, don't want anything to do with it. They didn't even come to the door. And you know what? That happened all day. Group of men outside, and I'd walk up and go, hey, want to invite you to this thing? And say, yeah, mister, we, we don't want to go. We don't want to go. We don't want to. That's what they say. But I got rice on beans. Come on, man. <laughs> and we worked all day, and we finally came back together in a little place, in the meeting place, and I remember it was hot. I remember my feet were killing me. I'd walk so much. Been out there working trying to evangelize for five hours, and I didn't even get a hand out a gospel track. I didn't much less present the gospel to anybody. You see, the word of God didn't have free course there. You understand? And I remember we sat there, and oh, pastor, they told me, it's so hot here. And I said, I know, it's terrible. And then I remember one of the gals said, my feet, they're killing me. And I thought you shouldn't have wore them heels, but you know. <laughs> 
But I thought about it, and I said, you know, mine too. It seems like the ground is harder here, literally. And they said, oh, this place is terrible. Let's go back to Mexico. And we said, viva Mexico. That's what we sat there saying. And it just seemed like the Lord said, you see there? Now you know how to pray for Frankie. He lives it every day. Every day. You see, you have to pray that we have opportunities, but the opportunities that the Lord provides for us. Because, you know, there's things that you can do and get away with in the flesh that have no eternal value. You know? I, can, I, I could talk a guy into saying a sinner's prayer. That don't mean he's getting saved. You understand? You know, we want the Lord to do the work. I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'll, I'll, I'll try to get to that place if there's understanding the Lord's in it. You understand? But, but that's the thing. You remember the parable of the sower and the seed? And, and Jesus Christ equated those, the, the, each part, each type of ground to a heart. And he said, you know, the sower went out to sow. And he says, the sower, when he explained it to the disciples, he said, explain that to us. He says, well, the sower, that's the guy that goes out. That's the preacher. He's preaching, and then the word of God is the seed. And he's sowing that seed. And he says, you know, the, there were some that fell on the wayside. And the wayside, and you guys in an agricultural community, you might understand this better than other places. The wayside isn't what's along next to the highway. That's not the wayside. Because lots of stuff grows there. Would you agree with that? But in this wayside, nothing grows there. Nothing. So when you, when you picture the rows of corn, and, and I know you don't do it manually here, but in many places in the world, they, they manually tend to their crops. Because they're just small crops, maybe as big as this building. And as they go and they make the furrows in the ground and they sow the seed, they walk between the rows of the corn or the barley, whatever it is. And as time goes on, that walking just makes that ground hard and compacted. That's the wayside. In Spanish, it's called los surcos. So I know that's what it means. And so it's, it's where men have walked and walked and, and, a, and a heart that's hard doesn't receive the word of God. It doesn't have free course there. Jesus said that's a hindrance to the word of God having free course. There's hardness. He says, the cometh the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. It was sown, it was proclaimed, but, but it had no effect. And then he said there were some that fell in the stony places, you remember? And he says that they were unwilling to endure hardness. There's some people who just won't put up with coming out here every Sunday. They just won't. Some people just won't put up with getting their toes stepped on once in a while. There's some people, they just won't put up with God telling them what to do. That's all there is to it. They're just going to be their own boss, and there ain't much I can do about that. You see, that heart will not receive the Word of God because of those things, those conditions that exist. Now, that's not to say that, that you can't work away at those conditions. Don't misunderstand me, but initially there's no, there's no receptivity to it. And he said, you know, he had no root in himself, and, and he dureth for a while, but when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word. I don't like the way he said that. I don't like that message at all. I think he's, you know, talking to me directly. Well, amen, right? Well, maybe you ought to listen up, you know. I mean, I think, I think that'd be the correct response, right? And then there's, there's among thorns, and, and he says the cares and the deceitfulness are rich. You understand that the idea behind that peril is that these are the hindrances that are in place that, that prohibit the word of God from doing that which God desires to do in the life of that person. There's, there's wayside, there's stony ground, there's thorns. He says there's good ground. Amen. Thank God for that. And it gets in there. And, and so this is, this is what Paul is saying. Listen, would you pray with me? And this is what I'm asking you this morning. Would you pray with the Mullers Amen. that the word of the Lord would have free course in Mexico? Amen. Not just that we go there, but that it would have free course. Amen. That God would open up those opportunities for us. And that we would sow the seed and, and we would be able to watch the miracle of new birth Amen. and growth and, and watch people walk with the Lord and, and find joy in that. And be able to send back reports. Look what God hath wrought. You know, the mothers haven't done anything in Mexico. You understand that. And I know you do. We've just been sort of the, the vehicle of it, the tool in God's hand. But God does it. Now, the second thing he asks, and we'll, we'll go back to 2 Thessalonians 3. So he asks, the word of the Lord would have free course. Would you pray with that? Pray for your missionaries in that sense that we're talking about this morning. That You know, as Brother Joe Merlo's down there in Chile, Brother Martin's over there in Japan, 
and it's already nighttime over there, or whatever time, but, but you know, that when he goes out, Lord, would you, would you open that door for him? Would you give him that utterance? Would you, would you prepare that heart for him so that as he preaches the word of the Lord, uh, of your word, it would have free course. It would be unhindered. The obstacles would be removed. It would be received. Now he says that the word of God would have free course. The second thing he says, and look at me back in verse 1, and we'll finish with this thought, I think. He says, finally, brethren, oh, there's the clock. I just now saw it. <laughs> Some churches you go to, there's no clock. You know what that means, right? Preach on, brother. But there's a clock, so now we have to be mindful of it. All right. You know what? If I preach till 1230, all the Methodists will be out of the restaurants by the time you get there. Right? We'll have free reign in the place. We can just go and have a, the best seating. We'll let them get in there now, and we'll just stay a little bit, learn a little more, and then, uh, Amen. Verse 1, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course. Now watch what he says here. And be glorified even as it is with you. Now that's a great missions application and desire. Even as it is with you. So the key is this. While Paul preached to these Thessalonians and he preached amongst them, you know, they received the word of God. They responded to it, and that's what made all the difference. Look at me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. And this is a familiar verse for many of us. He says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, <coughs> because when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of who? But notice this. This is, this is the part which really amazes me, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You see, even in the hearts of believers, we need to remove the stones. Even in our hearts, we need to clear the ground once in a while and break up that fallow ground so that we can receive the word of God. Uh, Bible believers, uh, we tend to become... If we're not careful, we, we tend to become lazy with our response to God's word. There should never a Sunday go by that we're not responding to what God has said to us. You understand, in the book of Hebrews, it says that the, the gospel was preached as unto them as well as unto us. And it says, but it was not profitable for them not being mixed with faith, he said. So you get up and you preach the gospel, and today, here at Somerville Baptist Church, we preached a message from Second Thessalonians, and there are some that will leave here, and that word will have had no effect on them. And it, there could be a myriad of reasons. Next week it will. You, you understand? It, it, what we need to learn is how to be more consistent in our attitude towards the word of God. Amen. And mix it with faith. He says here that the word of God was received as the very word of God. And, and, and here's something, things that can help. You know, when you come to church here on Sunday, do you understand that God in his providence, and I, I don't profess to understand more than this, but in his providence, he decided to expose you to 2 Thessalonians 3 this morning. This is what he did. Now, I'm just the tool in his hand, but he decided this is the passage that I have for you this morning. This is God's word. And, and, and these are the truths that I want you to meditate on today. This is what I've desired for you. And, and sometimes we think, oh, we've heard that before. <clears throat> How many of you men have a favorite dish at home? Yeah? Or what, are you going to have her serve it only once in your life? That's it? You know, my wife makes some mean enchiladas. And I'm happy when she tells me, hey, you're going to come home for lunch? I think I'm going to make enchiladas. I say, I was on my way. <laughs> you know? But I've had them before. I've had them a hundred times. And I'll have them a hundred times more and love it every time. You understand? There's four gospels, not just one. God repeats himself all the time. 
And in fact, he even says, he says, you know, I write these things even though you, uh, you know these things, but it's expedient that you hear them again. That's what he said. You hear them again. You know, we sit up and we eat the same meals over and over. You only ever go in and out burger one time, that's it? No, man, I'm looking for them on the way back, right? I want to, you know, you get past Missouri, there's no more jack-in-the-boxes. And my heart just drops. No more jack-in-the-boxes past Missouri. So we'll stop at that last one, and I'll order 27 tacos instead of one. You know, I'm just kidding, but you understand? The book of Deuteronomy is basically a review of the other four books. Yeah, right. What do you mean you don't want to hear it again? You think you know everything there is to know about 2 Thessalonians 3? There's a lifetime of knowledge we don't even have an idea of what it's talking about. Amen? There's an eternity that we will be able to learn it. So this idea that, 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 that we don't need to be exposed to certain passages uh, more than once or twice, or this idea that, that we've got it. Be careful, brother. Be careful, you know, be careful because we don't have it. There's a ton of stuff in there that, that we don't even know what's going on. Amen? But, but he says, you know, we, we need to pray. Here's what, well, here's what Paul's saying. He's saying, I'm over here in Corinth praying, working, laboring in the Word. And, and you know, these, these Corinthians, man, they're, they're a work. And if you know anything about those letters, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, that, was a, that was a church that had some serious issues going on. All kinds of them, and it was they were they were immature, and it's not my my intention to, to review their problems, but but if you have any working knowledge of those letters, you understand that they're a very problematic church, and Paul was there working and laboring, and, and he's probably a thoughts crossed his mind more than once where he sat there and said, "Man, why can't they just get it? What what is what is the goal? Why can't? It wasn't like that in Thessalonica." And that's what he's writing. That's what he's saying. I, I wish. My prayer is that as you pray for me that the word of God has free course, but you'd also pray that, that where I'm laboring now, that they'd receive the word of God like you did. So that what happened here could happen there. And that's missions. That's missions. How many of you think you got a good thing going on here at Somerville Baptist Church? How many think it's a good church? How many of you honestly believe in your heart that, that more people ought to come out and see what a great church this is? Amen? I think that too. I do. Wouldn't you like to see something like this down in Mexico? Oh, even as it is with you? You see, that's what he's saying. You take a little bit of what this is and, and let's transfer it and export it somewhere else. You understand? And, and, and then the Word of God can effectually work in the hearts of other people and, and, and fulfill that which God has purposed it. Remember what we read in Isaiah 55? He said, I have a purpose for my Word. I got a purpose for my Word. And, and it's, it's salvation, but it's edification. It's sanctification. It's affecting change in the lives of believers as well. So it's not just the, un, the, the unsaved that need the Word of God. The, the saved need the Word of God as well. And we need to receive it as it is the very Word of God. And come in those doors going, Lord, today I'm here and I need you to speak to me. I need you to hear. I need to hear from you today, Lord. I don't know what you have for me, but, but Lord, just help me to be open to it. Work in my heart, even before I get here, that, that I would receive the Word of God. And, and, and it doesn't matter who it is preaching. Now, I know sometimes we have our favorite preachers. I, I understand that. I'll bet, when, I'll bet when Brother Adams comes over here, a whole bunch of you go, hey, man, I hope he gets to preach this year. Because I, I thoroughly enjoy listening to him. Don't you? He's a man of God. He's got great practical preaching, very engaging. I've, I've never been disappointed. So if I knew he was here to preach, I would probably already have a little mix of faith going before I even got in the door. I've never been disappointed before, you understand? I'd come expecting that I was going to get a blessing and I probably would not be disappointed. And it has nothing to do with the ability of Pastor Adams or any other of our favorite preachers. You understand that? It has everything to do with the heart preparation before you come. And you prepare your heart. And you say, Lord, I need to, I need to hear from you today. And it's not just Pastor Umber preaching. 
It's the very word of God that he is sharing with us. It's the very word of God. And as we receive it that way, it will effectually work in us. And it'll, it'll rot the changes or, or, or work the changes that the Lord desires in the ways that only he can do. So those are the thoughts for this morning. He's writing. He's focused on that effectual working power of the word of God and its ability to do that which you and I cannot. The word of God can affect change, change lives, change churches, change ministries, change a country. The word of God can do that. The word of God can do that. So we pray for the missionaries that as they preach the word of God, their preaching would cause change in others as it has in you and I. I've been changed by the Bible. I've been changed by this book. I love this book. And I love the God that gave it to me. And I love the Savior that he sent. Amen. He died for me. And I know that others, if they just get a hold of what this book says, and as God just, just opens their understanding, that, that they'll have that same relationship I have. Right. And that's what I want. That's what God wants. And he's, and he's asked us to be part of that process. Not everybody gets to go. A lot of people have to stay. But you've got to give. I think Dr. King said it best. You, either, you, 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 you pray, you stay, or you pay. That's it. Amen? It's one or the other. You don't get to opt out of the process. You've got to be a part of it. So Paul says pray. Pray as we go. and Pray these things about the Word of God. That it would, that it would land on good soil. That there would be prepared hearts. That God would open those doors of utterance. That, that you would give me those opportunities that are, that are divine. So that I don't have to labor in my own strength. That I'm working in the Spirit. And that, that, that what God is doing in, in that area where we're working, it, it will get done just exactly like He wants it done. Amen. That it will effectually work in them that hear it. Amen? That it will remove the obstacles and, and God's Word would have free course. God's Word would have free course. Christian, you might be here today and God's Word hasn't reached you in a while. I, I don't know, maybe there's some obstacles in your life. Maybe some of those conditions of the ground, or as Jesus talked about in that parable, maybe they apply to you. Maybe you need to, to just get alone with the Lord a little bit and ask Him to reveal some of that stuff to you. I, I haven't heard from you lately, Lord, and I guarantee you He's talking. He's been speaking. And sometimes uh, the things in our lives hinder us from hearing him. Maybe uh, you're chasing after too much money to pay your bills. Maybe you're, you're whatever it is. You understand? The deceitfulness of riches. Maybe the cares of this world. Maybe, maybe you just uh, you think God's just meddling a little bit too much. He's got the best plan for you. There ain't nobody got a better idea for your life than he does. Nobody. <laughs> and, you know, maybe you need to come up this morning and say, Lord, I'm here. I need to hear from you. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not saved. I, I don't know. Maybe you're visiting and talk about being born again, being saved. And we got people show you from the Bible. It's not about becoming a Baptist. We just show you what the Bible says, and you can take it from there. It's just what the Bible says, that's all. That's all we can do is just open it up and show you, hey, these are some things that the Lord wants you to know. Share that information. Maybe you're here this morning, you've never trusted in Jesus Christ. I beg you for the mercies of God, don't leave this place Amen. without Christ. Don't walk out those doors without him. So we're going to have an altar call and going to sing a song and the pastor's going to come and pray and, and we'll just take this to the Lord. Thank you so much.